Um, so today we're going to continue in Philippians. We're going to finish Philippians 2. The, the uh, passage is uh, Philippians 2, 19 through 30. If you want to go ahead and turn there. And the title for today is The Profile of a Christ Follower. And so today as we're talking about what the profile of a Christ follower should look like and, and what the profile of believers should have, um, I yesterday looked up just some online profiles, the the not so real profiles uh, of, of the stories that people are telling the world. And maybe it's real and maybe it's not. But the point of a profile uh, on social media or any, any space really is to communicate a message about yourself to the world, what impression you want the world to have about you. And I thought there were some in here that were pretty funny that if these people could say anything to the world, it would be, believe this about me. Uh, so these were on uh, different sites, and one person says this about themselves to the world. They say, their quote is, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> Irony. <laughs> Another person says, just a kid out heart with a beard and a mortgage. <laughs> yeah, brother, it's like, Growing up's tough, man. <laughs> and you guys know about the five love languages, right? Um, someone said sarcasm is my love language. <laughs> That's a tough one. I hope that didn't go on a dating site. Uh, the other, another person says, life is too short to not eat dessert. Amen. Standing with you on that one. Uh, another one says, I'm not weird. I'm just limited edition. <laughs> like, okay, that was pretty good. That was creative. So I was reading, surprisingly, those took longer than they should have to find last night. And as I was reading through them, I I just remember thinking, I was thinking about my study time, and I I usually like to use music in the the background just to help me study. And um, I feel for my wife because last night I was thinking, this this is what I would have written, and she had to sit through all of it. So last night I was thinking, I was thinking, my profile, if I were to make one today, would say, I start listening to Christmas music in September. <laughs> yeah, there's some fans, some fans, and some of you going, ah, oh, you're the problem with society. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was, that was a fun time studying yesterday with the Christmas music in September. Okay, and, and that's, I'm not even kidding about that. So every person creates for themselves uh, a profile that they want to show the world, um, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, we all have a set of characteristics and qualities that the world knows us by. Our profile helps people to predict uh, what they can expect from us. Uh, so a, a character profile for a good soldier might be someone who's courageous, someone who's loyal and responsible. A character profile for a good parent might be someone who is nurturing, sacrificial, and someone who teaches boundaries. A uh, character profile for a good leader might be someone who stands for what's right, someone who's not afraid to take risk, and someone who pulls out the strengths of those around them. So the question for us today is this. What are some profile characteristics that Christ followers should have? Some things that we should have in common. What qualities should people see in us and be able to go, yep, that's a disciple right there. That's a disciple of Jesus. And Philippians 2 Paul is pointing to some examples. Earlier in the chapter, he talks about Christ himself, Christ making himself humble. He's, in verse 6, he says, in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This means that even though Jesus himself is divine, he took on the form of a servant for a while. He submitted himself to the will of the Father. God came down and took on the likeness of man. He became obedient to the point of death on a cross so man can have eternal life. That's amazing. God on, God on high, seated in heaven, comes down and humbles himself here on earth among men for our sake. Did not have to subject himself to humiliation, but in his humility, he does it willfully so we can be saved. He came down to our level. He comes and he, he, God literally came down and looked at us at eye level to advocate for our souls. And then Paul goes on to give a profile about himself in that same chapter. He says he's willing to be poured out 
like a drink offering, so others may be built up in the faith. Paul will, willfully goes through sufferings. He goes through trials and imprisonments. He goes through mistreatment and even the po- his possible death to see the gospel flourish in communities. Now we come to a place where we get to see the profile of two men that he's gonna continue to talk about in this chapter in verses 19 through 30. The two, two men who were serving with him in his imprisonment, they were there alongside him. They were there to minister to his needs and they were mentored by him. Their names are Timothy and Epaphroditus. If you don't mind turning with me to verses 19 through 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send you Timothy so that I too may be cheered of news by, uh, of new, by news of you. For I have no one like him who, will genuinely con- who is genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests. He's saying other people who even come in the name of Christ, they seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father has served me in the gospel. He's saying Timothy has been so diligent. He's brought himself close to me and, and, and we have this relationship like, like a son and a father striving for Christ. I hope therefore to send him to you as soon uh, and, and see how, so I'm sorry. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Paul is, Paul is saying, I, I want to come see you guys as well, but in my stead, while I can't be there, I'm going to send Timothy. And this is kind of where we're going today. What does it take to be sendable? And then he says, starting in verse 25, about Epaphroditus. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger a minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that not I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He's saying it would have, it would have really broken me down to see him come here to serve me and pass away, but God had mercy on him and had mercy on me in that effect. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He says, I know you can't be here, but you sent one who could, and he risked his life for, the, for care of me. So today we're going to focus on answering two questions concerning our profiles as Christ followers. Are we sendable and are we sacrificial? As we talk about our sendability, uh, we're, we're going to be looking into the character profile of Timothy as we talk about what it takes to be sacrificial or what it might look like. We're going to look at the character profile of Epaphroditus. So number one, are we sendable? Now, I know you guys keep hearing me say this word, and I know sendable is not a word, <laughs> but bear with me. We just kind of need it to be for the duration of, of, of this message. So do, are we sendable? Do we, share a, do we have a posture of, I'm listening to God. I'm listening, God. I'm listening for you. Send me. Is that our posture? A part of, that's a part of both Timothy and Epaphroditus' profile. They were willing to go where the Lord needed them against their com- comfort, against their convenience, and with limited resources. And they were willing to go to unpopular places. They went to spend time with an inmate. They went to spend time with Paul and his oppression, not in the most glamorous part of his ministry, but in the dungeons, in the chains, in the darkness, in the despair, in the shortage. That's when they put their boots to the ground. It was not the glitz and glamour of public ministry. And to tell you the truth, that's not how most of ministry is. Most of of ministry is servant work. It's getting into the muck and the mire with people, into the nitty gritty of life. It's working through the uncomfortable things so others may feel the love of Christ and then so that Christ may be glorified. This is what Christ calls us all to in one another's lives. Timothy was sendable 
because he understood these things. Verses 19 and 20 again. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you as soon uh, so that I may be cheered cheer by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Paul wanted to send Timothy to minister to the churches in Philippi. Paul's imprisonment in Rome wouldn't allow himself to do it on his own. And so he looks to the one who says, he can go in my stead and I can trust that he will treat things well. Is that us? Are we that person? Where the Lord can tap on our shoulders and say, I trust they will be diligent in the work. Timothy was so sendable because Paul knew he could trust him to speak on his behalf and on behalf of the gospel. Paul trusted that Timothy would care for the people and that he trusted, he trusted Timothy as a Bible teacher. And, um, and maybe we should reverse those orders. I think it's Timothy's care for scripture and the word of God and the heart of God that flowed out into his welfare for people and to his care for people. And let that be it for all of us. Let us be so drawn in by the heart of God that we can't help but saying, yes, Lord, send me. Send me to those who need to experience this care. Are we a people that God can send to care for his people? To help Christian community grow, as Timothy was doing in Philippi. To care, care for the welfare, uh, welfare of other believers. One thing I remember from my time in seminary was this. Uh, in, in one of my preaching classes, one of my classmates asked our professor, who, who was a career-long preacher, he, he just asked him about kind of how he noticed some people were holding a really harsh preaching style from the pulpit. And I remember this as clearly as day. My professor said, you have to remember, these are God's children you're speaking to. And I think about that often. If I was standing with God in a room and he told me to address his people, how would we handle that? Would we berate them? Or would we encourage them at the right time and correct them with wisdom at the right time? Paul actually writes this to Timothy in another letter about how to go about dealing with people. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Paul knows that people have a tendency to get distracted by false teachings. That was going on back then, and we know it's still going on today. So the model he gives to Timothy is to correct with patience. This word patience, is, it's, yes, it, yes, there's a zeal for truth, but that's never separated for our heart from people. Scripture says Christ is full of grace and truth. What about the adulterous woman? Where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. But go and sin no more. Grace and truth. Christ stoops down and looks her in the eye. Do we do that with the people that Christ is sending us to? Do we get to their level, look them in the eye and say, I'm here. What are you going through? And when, when we're at that eye level with them, then it's easier to, to pull them to the word of God. But as long as we're lording things down on people, we lose them before we even get to scripture. God is saying, or Paul is saying to Timothy, and God is saying to all of us through his scripture, these are my people. I need you to remain at the table with them. Bear with them, be patient with them, and walk them in the way of the truth. That's what Paul knew he had in Timothy. Someone you can trust to do just that because he cares for the welfare of the people, which is why I'm sending him to you. So what about us? Can God send us? Can God trust us with his people? Is patience with others in our character profile? Do we remain at the table with people when we hear something we don't like and we, when we even know it's something that needs to be fixed? Or do we shame that person? Do we just throw our hands up and say, I ain't got the time for this? The world is filling up with false doctrines and it has been for centuries. God is looking for people who are sendable to speak his truth. 
He's looking for people he can send to the youth to help them decipher the truth about sexuality. He's looking for people he can send to the bedridden to comfort in their loneliness and when they're down. He's looking for people he could send to different parts of the nation and different parts of the world to shed his light. People he can send across the hallway to talk to the atheist, the agnostic, or the pagan, that, and then let them know that you too can have an actual relationship with your creator and the creator of the universe. He's looking for people he can send to keep the word of God in the middle of even Christian discussions. When the enemy wants to distract us with fringe doctrines, false doctrines, or fringe theories. God is looking for people who care about people to represent him to others. Is that us? Are we sendable? Another reason Timothy was so sendable is because he was trained up well in the word of God. Timothy and Paul were very close. Paul refers to him as a son in 1 Corinthians 4. Timothy was so closely mentored by Paul. He would have heard the stories of Paul's past life as a Pharisee and his conversion into Christianity firsthand. He would have heard and reheard stories about miracles and all the close calls that Paul had, all the near-death experiences. They would have stayed up talking for hours and hours about theology and life and family and the word of God. Timothy spent a lot of time traveling with Paul on his missions as well. He was with Paul in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Ephesus, and here he was with Paul even in his imprisonment in Rome. Timothy was in Paul's hip. Maybe a good question for us is this. No doubt many of us want to be used by God but do we find it necessary to prepare ourselves to be used by God? Do we prepare ourselves in the word of God? Whether we are learning uh, for world's mi- world missions, local missions, or just everyday living, we should be learning from God's word daily, from his wisdom and wise counsel in our life. For Timothy, this happened by his devotion to scripture in the work of Christ. He was dependent on the word of God and he was built up by the mentorship of Paul. He had a wise counselor in the word. He didn't just say, I need a mentor, so I'm just gonna go get one. He he got one who was prioritizing the word of God. We should value those things as Christians in our training up in the word, being built up by the scripture and being built up by godly mentors. On our devotion to scripture, I came across an article that had... uh, Seven Unbelievably Good Reasons to Read Your Bible. It was really called uh, Six Unbelievably Reasons, but I took the liberty to make an editorial uh, (laughs) input, and and I added the seventh. It's by an author named Nellie Owens. The first one is this. It contains God's will for our lives. And she says this, the Bible's exhortation, guidelines, commands, and encouragement give us every concrete and infallible insight into God's will for us in every aspect of life. It contains God's wisdom and direction for our lives. Remember, Scripture says, all all Scripture is God-breathed. It's all inspired by God. It's profitable for our use. Number two, we should read our, our Bible daily because it's nourishment. And then the author says this, imagine you go a day without eating anything, then a week, then a month, and time goes on and you get weaker and weaker. That same nourishment that our body needs and we wouldn't dare neglect uh, missing too many meals. Why is it so easy to miss uh, so much nourishment from the Lord? And, and I, one thing that I found is if you're having trouble getting into the rhythm of, of reading Bible, at the beginning, for me, it felt like, oh, great, I did good today. I read my Bible. But then as you build that appetite, and let me just say it this way, as you build that love for God's word, then you get to understand the nourishment of it. And it ter- transforms from, oh, I did great. I read the Bible to, oh, man, like I haven't gotten the word of God today. So we should have an appetite for these things. Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that receives proceeds from the mouth of God. Number three, we should read our Bible daily because it gives us discernment. Discernment is the ability to decipher good from bad. 
the author says, as human beings, it's natural to seek our own. And isn't that true? Our natural default is to seek what's best for us. So it isn't easy for everyone to discern from good and bad because why we're seeing the world through these lenses of what's best for me instead of starting with what's God's perfect will. Well, God's word slices through all of this and directs us in the way that is right. And I'll tell you guys that I've learned this recently uh, just from marriage uh, about discernment. And uh, I guess me and Lexi are about two and a half years into our marriage, so we're still learning. But what I'm noticing is that sometimes when we disagree, my air isn't always on what I say, but it's more so on how I say it. And, and I find myself that sometimes uh, I'll just draw in and, 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 and withhold something and get kind of short, and then I just walk away and I just go and sit down. And sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'm just minding my own business, but it feels like there's something tapping me on the shoulder. Something I'm saying, nah, you know better than this. You get your tail up and go back and apologize to your <laughs> wife. <laughs> It happens over and over again, especially when I'm trying to prepare a message or something. It's like, don't come around here trying to prepare the word of God and you ain't even doing it right. And so sometimes I just get that tap and it's like, yeah, I know what's right. I got to do this. So what do I do? I walk slowly back into the room. My bad, babe. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's in those moments that I'm thankful that the Lord has instilled his scripture and written it on my heart. Because it's been put in there, he can tap on my shoulder and go, remember what I said. Now do what I said. That's discernment. As, as, as it, it's grounded. It should always be grounded uh, in, in what God says is right and wrong. It's for our big decisions in life, and it's for our daily living. It's for our relational living as we seek to glorify God. Number four is this. The Bible instructs us to righteousness. It contains words and examples of all of these people who went before us. Some got it right and some got it wrong. And this is what I love uh, about scripture. Uh, God didn't compile a book for us of, of superheroes. He compiled a book, of, of, of course, with his spirit being very active, his person being very active. But for, for humans, it's a lot of people like you and me. And so sometimes it can be tempting to read the Bible and go, I, I can't reach that. I can't ascertain that. But guess what? Moses couldn't always reach that. And David couldn't always reach that. Paul and Silas couldn't always reach that. That's why the sacrifice of Christ is important for all of us. So the Bible gives us examples using a lot of people just like us, not just superhuman Christians who are skating through life. No, it's people running into each other, bumping heads, and trying to get it right. And then I'll add this one thing that I think is worth saying. The Bible doesn't always mention every particular scenario in the world that we might face, but it gives instruction that we can apply to every kind of scenario. The wisdom of the Bible is sufficient to speak to everything we might run into. Number five, it contains power to overcome. Christians still face all types of temptations. Even, we have, even when we have God in our lives, just because we're saved doesn't mean we don't run into temptation with greed, lust, jealousy, all these other sins still knock on our door. But Psalms 1, verses 2 and 3 say, the man who delights in the instruction of the Lord is like a strong tree planted, planted by the waters and fruitful. As sin competes for our thought life, the way to overcome sin is by focusing on God's word. Number six, the reason we should be reading the Bible is it's full of God's promises. The Bible tells us God's intention for us. My favorite one is this, Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. God wins in the end. And because we're with him, he says, I will make all things right for you. And then I'd regret it if I didn't add this last one, number seven. 
Reading the Bible daily helps us to understand God better. I say this often when I'm uh, to, to groups that um, are learning how to do Bible interpretation. One of my teachers told us this in, in seminary was, scripture is God telling us about himself. Every scripture we read, we should be reading with the lens of what is God telling me about himself here? So often we start with, where am I in the story? It doesn't mean we won't end there, but we start with what is God saying about himself? How should I respond to what he's saying about himself? How am I to participate in his story? And then Timothy was sendable because he was trained in the way of Christ by a good mentor. I can't say enough about having a good mentor in our lives. We all need people who understand our place in life and who can speak to what we're going through. People who can speak wisdom to us and correction. We need people who can read us when we're down and will lift us up and people who can, someone who has license to call us out when we get it wrong. I've been fortunate to have many people speak into my life, but there's just three I wanna mention really briefly who had a major impression on me. When I was in my undergrad at Willamette University, there was a man from a group called Campus Ambassadors named Richard. Richard encouraged me to Christian living on a very secular campus. He trained me in small group leadership as I was leading the football Bible study. And his knowledge for Bible and theology inspired me towards seminary. That was 12 years ago, maybe. Me and Richard still speak today. And when I got to seminary, I met Dr. Metzger. He's my theology professor. He saw something in me and he cared to spend extra time with me. There was even a semester where I didn't have class with him. So he's like, hey, let's just take a lunch every week and get together. And we just connected on a personal level. That bit of intentionality meant the world to me. And let us know that as we're dealing with those coming up under us. That bit of tensionality can mean the world to them. Dr. Metzger encouraged me to always think relationally about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how that, about how he's infusing that into humanity and how we are to participate in that. This really shaped how I read, how I study, and how I teach scripture today. Dr. Metzger's theology class was also the place where I met Lexi, and so because we got married, he finds it necessary to take credit as the matchmaker. <laughs> he says he's my matchmaker, he's my athletic trainer, he's my, <laughs> he goes through a list. And then when I was working uh, in, in the Multnomah County jails for four years, um, I was mentored by my supervisor. His name is Chaplain Kyle. And Chaplain Kyle is a black man who also got into corrections at a very young age, corrections chaplaincy at a young age. He could relate to what I was going through and he could even prepare me for what was to come. He seemed to think biblically about everything and that's what I really like about him. It was his default. That inspired me to always make decisions with God's word at the center of whatever we were going into. Whenever I have a conflict, even to this day, if I have to deal with or an awkward situation, I, I think, how would Chaplain Kyle respond to this situation? For instance, it's something as simple as a handshake. When I started working at the jail, some of the staff told me, hey, when you come here, make sure you're not shaking hands with inmates. And it wasn't a security thing. It was a cleanliness thing. They're going, you don't know where their hands have been. And I'm watching. I'm going, oh, okay, it seems a little odd for a chaplain. And so when I asked Chaplain Kyle about it, he directed me to how Jesus reached out and touched the man with leprosy. Everyone else called this man unclean a man who probably hadn't been touched in years, and Jesus touches him. Now, of course, we know Jesus has a miraculous touch, and I don't, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but Jesus also gives dignity with his touch, and that's something that I can do too. So for a moment in, in a day, an inmate can say, those chaplains made me feel like a person and not a thing today in a world where they're telling them they're less than people. Chaplain Kyle would say that we were trying to show the heart of Christ to the world. And as I'm going through this list of my mentors, I hope you're thinking about your past mentors. The person that you're currently mentoring now or the person you're anticipating to mentor in the future. Or if you're a person looking for a mentor, I, I, I hope you're thinking about the importance 
of finding one who is grounded in the word of God. As we think about mentorship and Christian counsel, we must keep Christ at the center of it all. All of our wisdom should flow from his heart. Let one generation lead the next generation in the way of Christ. Let's develop Christ-centered and sendable disciples. My last point for today is this. Number two, are we sacrificial? Are we sacrificial? Paul says this, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger to minister to my need. For he has been longing for you and has been in distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death. So here's the situation really quick. When the church in Philippi heard that Paul was in Rome, they were in prison in Rome, they wanted to help, but of course they couldn't all flood there, right? They couldn't all just pick up and travel and go. So what did they do? They wanted to send a gift. It was probably a cash gift, a monetary gift, and a gift of supplies. And they did it by this one man, Epaphroditus, probably stood up and said, I'll go. What are you looking for, Lord? I'll go. And not only does Epaphroditus get there and deliver the gift to Paul for his living, but he goes and he works alongside with Paul. He becomes his servant. He becomes his aide. He becomes his helper while Paul is in this confinement. All of this to help the gospel advance. But within his time there, Epaphroditus falls seriously ill to the point where he almost died. So Paul sent him back with his blessing, essentially telling the people, he didn't quit on me. He actually almost died here because he was going so hard. Now I'm giving him back to you. Encouraging the Christians and Philippi to honor Epaphroditus and others who risk it all like this. Now our guest best is Epaphroditus on this way back. It's probably the one who carried the message to Philippi, the, the message we're reading right now, the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians. Epaphroditus was sacrificial, fat, is sacrificial because he risked his own life to support the walk, work of the gospel. He persevered through illness that almost killed him on the mission. When Paul says Epaphroditus risked his life in this letter, the Greek word he used is, is a gambler's term. It's an old gambler's term in that culture that meant to risk everything on a roll of the dice. One commentator says, Paul wrote that for the sake of Jesus Christ, Epaphroditus was willing to gamble everything, saying, here's my life, Lord. Here's my life. How do you want to advance your gospel? Another way that Epaphroditus risked it all was volunteering just to be in close proximity and in company with Paul. Remember, Paul was in a Roman prison. He's facing the possible death penalty. Most people would have avoided looking like an accessory to his mission, right? But Epaphroditus takes up his side. He risks being caught up in Paul's case with him to serve for the sake of the gospel because he knows how important this work that Paul is doing he joins with him to push this work forward, even if it means endangering himself, even if it means losing his own life. He knows the work of God is worth the sacrifice, and here we are today benefiting from his sacrifice. So the question we can ask is, how does Epaphroditus keep this resolve? With all of them is impending endangerment, how does he decide to stay in there? In Acts 16, you can read about Paul's first trip to Philippi. And perhaps Epaphroditus learned from Paul's example. I'll give a real quick recap here. I would encourage you guys to read Acts 16 because it is action-packed and you're kind of going like, whoa. So one night, Paul was sleeping and in a vision, God said to him, I want you to go to Macedonia. And so they get up and they sell to Macedonia. And, and, and they go to Philippi, which was a district in Macedonia. And it was all in Roman colony. And as they're teaching, there's this peculiar see, scene where it says this servant girl, this slave girl was following them around for days, but she wasn't just a normal servant girl or slave girl. It was really odd because she was demon possessed and this demon could tell fortunes. And the wicked part is that's actually how her masters made money off of her 
was by her fortune telling by this demon. And to make the story even odder, as she's walking around, she's following these two ministers of Christ going, these are the servants of the most high God. These are the servants of the most high God. These are the servants of the most high God. And Paul's looking at her like, yo, I'm about done with this girl. I would not want this demon speaking for me. And the scripture actually says, after several days, Paul gets annoyed and he casts the demon out of her. <laughs> you go, what is going on here? What is going on here? So you can imagine this probably made someone mad, right? So her owners come up and they're like, yo, that's how we made money. And so what do they do? They get the authorities and they tell, they tell on Paul. They tell on Paul and the boys. And so they turn him over to the authorities and the people of the town come around and they start attacking Paul and Silas and the fellows with them. And it's like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Like this man just freed this woman from this demon possession, but what does man say? Nah, they're messing up our economy. We gotta lock them up. So from there, uh, they turn them over to the police and they get thrown into prison. And then... This is where the story starts getting better in, in, in Paul and Silas's favor. As they're in prison and they've been beaten with rods, they've been flogged and they're locked and shackled up, what do they do in prison? They start praying out loud and they start praising the Lord. And then all of a sudden, like I said, this chapter is action packed, this major earthquake comes along and it shakes their chains off. And when the jailer notices it, he runs in and he goes, oh my gosh, where's my sword? I'm going to fall on my sword. I'm going to kill myself now because if I don't, Rome will kill me for all the prisoners have escaped. Paul says, hold up, hold up. We're here. Don't do that. And this very man who was Paul's captor, Paul begins to minister to him. And he asks, what do I need to do to be saved? And Paul and Silas minister to him and, and they minister to his household and they were all saved. And here we have these first converts in Philippi. So after reading this story and this crazy series of events of how Christianity came to Philippi, I have to ask myself, why did God call Paul to Philippi if he knew there was so much danger there? All of this happened. Paul went through all of these episodes and remember, it started with God giving him a vision saying, I want you to go there. Why would God send him into that impending danger? One answer that I resolve to is this. Even in the darkest areas, God still wants to get his light to people. Paul faced a lot of trouble in Philippi, but he still reached out to the jailer and his family so they could be saved. Paul still partners with the churches in the very city that wanted to kill him. And Epaphroditus still serves in that city to bring God's light where there's so much darkness. Paul still has love for Philippi after things went so terribly wrong there. He was beat, he was accused, he was imprisoned and so on. And a lot of people would have said this if they were in Paul's shoes. A lot of people would have said, you know what, I'm out. Why should I deal with this place any longer? I'm taking my cue and I'm hitting the road. But Paul didn't. And I want to say this today. You know what? A lot of people would say that about Portland today. Portland and the greater Portland area where we're living. A lot of people saying there's so much resistance to God there. There's so much darkness there. I'm out. I'm moving. See you later. I believe God is calling his people to be a light in difficult places. It doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean things are going to go as planned. It might mean things get a little bit crazy at times. But God knows the darkness in his cities. So he brings the light by putting his followers in those areas. Paul's mission was a miraculous appointment. But it was still filled with opposition. Just because we're on God's mission doesn't mean there won't be opposition. And he's actually saying that opposition is why I'm sending you there. I need my light. But if you go in without my character, they're going to turn harder against me. This is why he calls us to go with patience, gentleness, 
as he tells Timothy. Epaphroditus' mission was appointed by God, but he had to sacrifice a lot himself. He, pre- he persevered just as Paul did for the sake of the gospel and taking the example of Christ who persevered trials so that we can have eternal life as a result of his sacrifice for us. When we're facing hardships and it feels hard to prioritize the gospel, let us think about Paul and Silas. Let us think about Timothy and Epaphroditus and let us think about the person of Christ himself. Let us know that sometimes when God wants to reach his people, he will use our perseverance and sacrifice through trials and hardships to do so. Maybe you've gotten to a point in your life where you're going everywhere I turn, it's it's another roadblock. It's another stop sign. I can't seem to push through. Maybe you're in a season where it seems like there is more resistance than aid, where there's more imprisonments and beatings than Timothy's and Epaphroditus. Maybe you feel isolated and left out by God. I want to challenge you to think the exact opposite. When the enemy's trying to tell you it's against you, God's will is against you, everything, all the momentum is against you, I think God is saying, no, 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 no. I tapped on your shoulder because I see you ascendable. Does he need to put light where there's ample light? No, no, he's putting light where there's darkness. Stay the course. Stay the course. So I want to wrap up with the questions we started with. What does our profile say about us? As Christ followers, we should be sendable with the heart and the words of Christ. We should be committed to scripture and we should prioritize caring for others. As Christ followers, we should be sacrificial on mission to bring the light of Christ to dark places. The last thing I have for us, and and, and then we'll pray and dismiss, is this. James 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, incomplete, lacking in nothing. Will you go to the Lord with me? Father, I pray that you tap on shoulders. Maybe someone in here is is like the jailer. They've heard the prayers. They've heard the tells of believers, the the stories, the accounts of believers. They, they, They have heard the truth of the gospel. They have seen your people glorify you in the midst of oppression and persecution. Maybe they're like the jailer in, in, in the sense that their, their heart is soft and they're open to you right now. And Father, and maybe they're asking that question, what should I do to be saved? If that's you, I just want to reinforce the message of the gospel. We are sinful and deserving of death, but a perfect God came down, took the punishment for us so we can have eternal life. His name is Jesus. And I encourage you to put your faith in him. If that's you today and you want to make him the Lord of your life, I invite you just to say this, this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I know that you are God, that you died on a cross and rose so I may be free from eternal, eternal sin and death. I repent of my sins. I turn toward you. I put my faith in you. I want to live for you now and forever. And then, Father, for those in here who are struggling with heavy heartedness, saying, how am I to sacrifice when I feel like I can barely walk with the weight of the world on me? I pray that they turn in our refreshing by your word. And then I pray that you send people along their path to encourage them and lift them up. Highest biblical counsel. Father, be with us today. 
send us into the mission field as sendable and sacrificial agents of your word and testaments of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.